this is Tom from anti-proton.com and I wanted to talk to you about how to read successfully radiation that's falling in the rain. As many of you know, I'm very skeptical when I see readings of five, six, seven hundred counts per minute coming from your rain. And I am incredibly skeptical when I see something over a thousand counts per minute coming from your rain. Unless, of course, you live in Belarus just downwind from Chernobyl, or if you happen to be in a boat in the Pacific Ocean about 10 miles off the, uh, off the coast of uh, Fukushima. Aside from those two places, I'm very skeptical. But, as a scientist, of course, I cannot discount anything without proof one way or the other. In order to make it easier for all of us to be 100% clear on these things, I think we all need to try standardizing the way we test things a little better. The way, by, by standardizing the way we test things, we're able to make it harder for people to say what is or isn't true. Thus, people who are not real, who are faking things, will be weeded out because it's hard for them to fake things uh, when you use correct testing. People who are real, who actually are getting higher readings, they can uh, have more of a leg to stand on. It's harder for people to attack them and say they're wrong. The realistic uh, 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 reality of this is that if everybody actually followed correct testing procedures or as correct as a person can get when they don't have a laboratory, we would probably find that a lot of these 100, 200, 300, even up to maybe 500 count per minute readings are probably realistic. They are probably falling down and they're probably mostly in most places in the United States caused by the result of radon uh, falling down from the sky, which is just part of the decay series of uranium, which is perfectly normal. Um, I hate to say it, I know that's a mundane explanation, but in most things the mundane explanation turns out to be the correct one. Let me also state for the record that I do not deny that Fukushima happened. I, I don't know why some people think that. Uh, I posted a series of videos discussing my theories for what was happening, and the uh, meltdown of both, oh excuse me, both, I hold up three fingers, all three reactors. So I am quite confident that Fukushima melted down, as is any scientific person. I mean, I don't think that's in any, anybody, I don't, I don't think anybody's denying that. Now, what I am denying, of course, well, no, I'm not denying anything. What I am saying is I don't believe that, you know, in, uh, massive amounts of plutonium and things like that are falling upon us thousands and thousands of miles away, but you are going to pick up things like cesium-137, strontium-90, uh, 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 little weird things, americium, very strange things that, you, that, that, that come out of a reactor. Alright, here is how you test correctly. For, the fir for, for starters, do not hold your camera in your hand while shaking a Geiger counter around with a rubber glove on and a paper towel in your hand and nobody can see anything around it. If you do that, then people can very easily ask you, well, what's under the paper? Why is it like that? Why are you showing this? Why are you, are you freaking out and showing me just this little bit? Show everything. Pull your camera back. Show everything. I am not performing a real test. It's not raining. This is my crappy Geiger counter. This is not my good pancake Geiger counter. So, um, I'm not going to worry about doing that, but if I were doing a real test, and next time it rains, I'll do a real test and show you. Uh, I would take the camera and I would pull it far back from the car and show there's nothing around me. I don't have a radioactive source anywhere that could be setting off the Geiger counter. And you'll have to excuse me, I'm on a road here so there's lots of noise. Also, I don't want you to see all the stickers on my car. Um, if, you sh if you think you should, you should take a plastic bag and put some tape uh, on the bag and stick it on your license plate and on your decals in your car so people can't see them. They don't need to know any information about you. This will allow you to pull back a distance and show people things without the worry of people finding out like where you live. Try not to frame your house in your background, of course, too. You know how the internet is. It's full of wackos, right? Well, anyway, <clears throat> first off, take your Geiger counter. You need to have a, a Geiger counter that is, is relatively new. It's in good shape. It can be old, but it needs to be in good shape. It needs to be calibrated. This Geiger counter was calibrated, uh, when was this guy calibrated? Uh, April, I think, of this year. So it's pretty recent uh, in calibration. You want to go no more than about a year if you're going to be doing actual re you know, testing. I would normally use my larger pancake Geiger, Geiger Mueller too, but it's currently uh, uh, back at SC International for repairs and recalibration. Um, I like to be very calibrated. This one's actually getting close to its calibration. Now, Everyone likes to use the paper towel method. Technically speaking, this isn't the most scientific approach, but you know, whatever, it's good enough. Take your paper towel. Take your Geiger counter. 
take a bag of, of light salt or something like that if you like and put it down and put the Geiger counter near it so that everybody can hear that it takes at a certain rate. Or you can show it to the camera. I'm getting 18 counts per minute, 20 counts per minute. This is varying and going up and down and not very indicative of anything. If I ran it for a, for a couple of hours and took a baseline, I would find that I'm probably somewhere around 14 counts per minute, 15 counts, somewhere in there. When I, t when I take my Geiger counter and move around this general area, moved a little, goes up and down as you move it, but it's not shooting up anywhere. It's not going in the hundreds. I don't have a source hidden on me anywhere that's making it go up. It's important to show this. Take your paper towel. Show that the paper towel is just a paper towel. In other words, nothing in here, nothing in here, you know? It's like a magic trick. Show that the paper towel is not reading anything. Show both sides of the paper towel. Show it entirely that it is a paper towel. Why not? Because that, that makes it hard for people to ask you whether it really is and what you might have done. No radioactive sources. All right. Take your paper towel, put it on the car, make sure the camera's pointed at it. I, I don't have a person to help me with the camera, but if I, if I were, I would move the camera over so people can see. Wipe the car down. My car is in pretty good, clean condition, so this would be useless anyway. But it, even if it weren't, wipe the car down thoroughly. You probably want to wipe it longer than this if you're really doing your test. Now, hold your Geiger counter over it and do a spot test. This lets people see what's on the car immediately. If you're getting five or six hundred counts per minute from a piece of paper, then you should be able to immediately pick it up. Now, some, some, some simple uh, things that you do and don't want to do. Here's some do's and don'ts. Do not take a paper towel that you believe is contaminated and stick it right on your Geiger counter. I mean, like, the Inspector series, for example, has a Geiger Mueller tube in the bottom. Uh, LND type, uh, uh, what is it, a 3717 or is it a 7317? I can't remember. I flip the numbers all the time. But anyway, it's a big pancake Geiger Mueller tube in the bottom. Don't stick it down like that. Because you just contaminated your Geiger, uh, your Geiger tube. Good job. If, if, if that really is putting off five or 600 counts per minute, you just contaminated your tube. Good job. Don't do that. What you can do is you can take a piece of wood. You can put a couple pieces of wood across it, two little planks of wood, little tiny pieces like balsa wood. You can buy it in any store. Test it make sure it's not putting off any particularly large amount of radiation itself, because wood can put off a little bit every now and then. Glue it down. Make sure it's still fine. Then you can put this underneath, put this on top, and it supports it above. The benefit of doing this, wait till the cars go by, the benefit of doing this is you isolate the unit. You lift it up above an object, and it always stays a uniform height, too. When measuring alpha particles and even weak beta particles, uh, the continuous slowdown of the particles, uh, the basically their change in energy with respect to distance in normal air, can be quite extreme. The gradient can be uh, uh, so, so intense that within a, a centimeter's distance it can make a huge difference in reading. So having a uniform distance is very important. Um, when you take your averages, when you're done taking your averages, always if you can on the same frame, and if you don't take it on the same frame, meaning that you've had to cut the camera off and you've had to reposition it, turn it back on again. When you're done, lift everything up. Show everything. Show everything. Show it around you. Lift up something that you've tested on. If you've seen me testing on the, on, I always test in that piece of wood uh, that I like to use. I also, if you notice, lift the wood up and show you what's underneath it afterwards and also usually before too. I move everything around. I show you the area entirely. It's still not, it's still not, it's still not that you couldn't test, I mean, that you couldn't uh, fake it. You still could. Who's to say there's somebody that's not, like, you know, on a floor below me who's putting a gamma sample up to the ceiling or something and therefore it's reading through? I mean, you could still fake it. The best way to prove that you're correct is to take your water, your dirt, your whatever, and send it to a private laboratory. Most universities at this point will not test samples because they're sick of doing it post Fukushima, but a private laboratory usually will. Let's look one up in the phone book. You can send it away. Um, testing with a laboratory will give you a scintillation test, usually, or they'll use an uh, um, uh, ultra high purity germanium uh, uh, tester. That's a lot of cars. There's just a lot of cars going by right now, and it's really annoying when you're trying to do a video. 
Anyway, this will tell you the exact energies coming out of the uh, out of the material. Because you can sit around and guess all day long. You can try to reverse engineer what you think the element is based on the decay rate, which is not always very accurate, I might add, too, especially with the uranium decay series. But there is nothing as accurate as getting the actual gamma readings from the object and then using that to uh, isolate the isotope. Then you know exactly what it is that's falling upon you. And as for these people that say that the readings drop within a couple hours and they would be useless, that is not true. The readings may be dropping, but they would not be useless. After seven generations of a half-life, the percentage of something drops below 1%. But it's a far cry from it actually being gone. It's going to take many, 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 many more generations before it truly starts to disappear. And most of those things become other unstable isotopes. If you really are worried about it, you could also send it to a lab for a mass spectro spectrographic reading. That will actually tell you. Mass spectrometer will tell you what's in it, regardless of whether it is or is not radioactive. Now, you might say, why would I want to spend the money and send it to a laboratory when I can just post my video on YouTube and show 500 counts a minute? Well, consider this. If you consider 500 counts a minute, or 1,000 counts a minute, or 10,000 counts a minute to be dangerous, then you would want to know, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you want to, if you thought your house was full of radon, you were pretty sure of it, wouldn't you, uh, you know, have your house tested for radon? If you thought your walls had asbestos, wouldn't you have them tested? And if you're posting it to YouTube, if you're posting it to YouTube and you don't think it's dangerous, you don't even think it's that amazing or interesting, why are you posting it? Anyway, um, that's all I can tell you. Just please, please, everybody. I don't know why, for example, everybody seems to be posting these videos of 10,000, 20,000 counts per minute, because that's an incredible amount of radiation that you are not going to find falling upon you. I mean, it's theoretically possible. There is actually a scientific event where it occurred one time and was documented in the Netherlands. But it was a one-time, one-of scenario, a perfect storm, if you like, and also the, the machine that was used to diagnose it, or not diagnose it, to, well, yes, diagnose it, but to test it was a, a scintillator, which is sensitive enough to pick up that many counts. Please do not put your Geiger counter down and show this little tiny picture of it. Let me give you an example of what you should not be showing. Do not do this. Oh, look, I've got this paper towel here, and here's my Geiger counter. And look, I've got this on here, and as you can see, it's thousands of counts per minute. Err, don't do that, because what's underneath here First off, that would be contaminated. It's not, because my Geiger counter doesn't work that way. But second off, what's under here, what's in here, what's near here, what, what do I have around me? Am I holding something? Who knows? Don't, just if, if you use these simple scientific practices, then your videos will be more reputable, and that's important. This has been Tom from anti-proton.com. Bye-bye.